Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on finance, constitution and economy. And question number one is Myrtle Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether full fiscal autonomy remains its policy. Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government will continue to make the case for full fiscal responsibility. However, as implementation of the Calman Commission proposals has demonstrated the transition to full fiscal responsibility and agreement of the detailed fiscal framework that would require to underpin it will take a number of years to complete. The Scottish Government's immediate priority is therefore to ensure that the Smith Commission agreement is implemented in full and that responsibility for employment policy, including the minimum wage, welfare, business taxation, national insurance and equality policy are devolved to the Scottish Parliament. These are the powers that this Parliament needs to further improve competitiveness create jobs and lift people out of poverty. Martin Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? Why has the Scottish Government renamed its policy full fiscal responsibility? And by what date, by what date does it wish to see this policy now implemented? Cabinet Secretary. I think the, uh, the, the Government's uh, position is that it believes that the people of Scotland should be in control of their own affairs, and that has never changed, whatever we call it, that's exactly what our position is. And as I've indicated in my earlier answer to Mr Fraser, uh, the Government would uh, support uh, full fiscal responsibility for Scotland. Uh, that would take time for that to be implemented. It would require the consent and the agreement of the United Kingdom Government. And in the short term, what we will argue for, and we'll have some more information on this tomorrow with the publication of the, uh, the Scotland Bill, is exactly the extent to which the UK Government is prepared to implement the uh, conclusions of the Smith Commission. And we will use the opportunity which was created by the meeting the First Minister and I had with the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State a couple of weeks ago to advance the arguments for further powers beyond the Smith Commission's conclusions. Jackie Bailey. Um, the Cabinet Secretary may be aware of House of Commons research published today that shows that Scots benefited last year by almost £1,600 ahead more in public spending than in England, clearly demonstrating the benefit of the Barnett formula to Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary therefore agree that when he achieves full fiscal autonomy, or whatever he chooses to call it, it does actually mean the end of the Barnett formula for Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. As Jackie Bailey will be aware, uh, the uh, the, the financial arrangements uh, that, that, uh, within which Scotland operates will be changing as a consequence of the Smith Commission. If she hasn't worked that out, then I suggest she goes away and does. Uh, I suggest that Jackie Bailey really goes away and does some research because these issues will change as a consequence of the fiscal framework that is put in place uh, arising out of the Smith Commission, which I thought the Labour Party uh, supported. But maybe there's going to be another change of position from the Labour Party. On that question, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Order. that was the case. Now, what Jackie Bailey omitted from her question to me was the fact that, of course, with full fiscal autonomy also comes a range of economic powers and responsibilities to strengthen the economic performance of Scotland. Uh, we demonstrated just yesterday how we use the existing powers of the Scottish Parliament to improve the, the economic competitiveness of Scotland through the Scottish Business Pledge. Uh, we, secure, we seek other ways of doing that uh, through wider financial responsibility, and that, of course, would come with full fiscal responsibility. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that we should pursue uh, fiscal responsibility with purpose, coupled with a comprehensive economic strategy that would include the public, private and third sectors working in partnership to develop and implement a range of transformational policies that will deliver an export-based increase in growth and address inequality by increasing economic participation to that of the top five advanced economies? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think, I think per perhaps um, Mr Gibson, um, Mr. Gibson has, has, has done certainly Jackie Bailey a public service by explaining some of the opportunities that arise out of exercising these wider economic powers to strengthen the economic performance of Scotland. So that, uh, what Mr Gibson has set out to Parliament today is an illustration of some of the additional powers that would become available to the Scottish Parliament if we had greater financial responsibility. And of course, the, the Scottish Government will use every lever we have at our disposal to strengthen the economic performance of our country within the existing settlement. But if we acquire further powers, which is the basis of the discussions that I will take forward with the UK Government, uh, then we will have those opportunities into the bargain to strengthen the Scottish economy. Thank you. Question two, Chick Brodie. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Office for Budget Responsibility. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, Scottish Government officials are in regular dialogue with the Office for Budget Responsibility on a range of issues, including the production of devolved tax forecasts, which the OBR publishes at each UK fiscal event. Jake Brody. Thank you. Uh, in its fiscal outlook of 2014, the OBR, when considering Scotland's new carbon taxes, said its forecasting methodologies were, and I quote, work in progress, i.e. incomplete. In its fiscal outlook for 2015, it said on the methodologies that nothing had changed. On that basis, how confident is the Scottish Government that, that in applying the remaining attributable portion of the Barnett contribution that we are not being or will be shortchanged? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr Brody's question gets to the heart of the issue around block grant adjustment, which is an inherent part of the uh, proposals under the Kalman Commission and will, of course, also feature in the Smith Commission proposals. Um, as I explained to Parliament during the passage of the budget, um, the Office for Budget Responsibility arrived at a particular estimate of the effect of the um, uh, devolution of the land and buildings transaction or stamp duty land tax and landfill tax to the Scottish Parliament, and the Scottish Government um, arrived at a different estimate, which was, of course, verified independently by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. These were different numbers, and they illustrate the gap, which is the danger that uh, Mr Brodie has highlighted in his question. Um, the, the, the Government agreed, and I shared and confirmed this with Parliament, uh, a, a conclusion to those discussions on this issue with the United Kingdom Government. Of course, that was a one-year settlement, and we will have to embark on those discussions for further um, arrangements in relation to the adjustment of the block grant to take into account the devolution of these taxes. Thank you. Question number three, Kenny McCaskill. <coughs> Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to meet the UK Government to discuss proposed constitutional changes. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, on the 15th of May, the First Minister and I met the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State for Scotland and the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State. At that meeting, the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for Scotland made clear commitments that the Scotland Bill would implement the Smith Commission in full. We will test that commitment when we see the Scotland Bill tomorrow. The Prime Minister also undertook to consider Scottish Government proposals for devolution beyond the Smith Commission. We will put those proposals to the UK Government and I will meet the Secretary of State to discuss the next steps. Thank you. Ken McCaskill. Uh, I very much welcome the declaration by the Scottish Government to defend both the legislation and the principles of the Human Rights Act. And with regard to that, can I ask if they will now modify their position on prisoner voting uh, to adhere to the European Court rulings they endorse? Cabinet Secretary. Enough, so the Scottish Government does not have the legislative competence to change the position on prisoner voting. Once the Scotland Bill delivers the Smith recommendations to transfer all powers to the Scottish Parliament in relation to elections to the Scottish Parliament and local elections in Scotland, it will be for this Parliament to consider all of the relevant franchise issues. The Scottish Government has no proposals to amend the rules on prisoner voting. Thank you, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that the Smith Agreement, supported by the Devolution Committee's critique of the UK Government's draft clauses, provides the right basis for both devolving welfare benefits and retaining the benefits of the Barnett Formula? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the, the, the Smith Commission proposals um, are clearly supported by the Scottish Government. Uh, they give um, uh, some additional responsibility to the Scottish Parliament, as Mr Macdonald well knows, because he sat through the evidence on the Devolution for the Powers Committee, that the conclusion of that committee was that uh, the draft clauses that were put forward by the United Kingdom Government do not translate the proposals from the Smith Commission in full into the necessary legislative effect. I think it might have been helpful if Mr Macdonald and his colleagues had made that point before the election, not after the election, um, because I seem to remember them suggesting that the government was somehow um, picking a fight where no fight needed to be picked on this question. Um, but I'm glad that he's now arrived at the, uh, a, a more sensible and considered position on this issue. And uh, we will certainly um, look forward to having Mr Macdonald's support as we press the United Kingdom government to devolve um, in full the responsibilities that were envisaged by the Smith Commission Agreement last November. Thank you. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to boost the economy of North Ayrshire. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, Scotland's economic strategy reaffirms our commitment to increasing sustainable economic growth for all of Scotland, which is essential to achieve a more productive, cohesive and fairer country. Our continued investment in infrastructure, regeneration and business support is helping to boost the economy of North Ayrshire. 
Kenneth Gibson. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for that <clears throat> reply. Although I'd like to have some more specifics, to be frank. Can you tell the Chamber what the impact of Scottish Government actions to boost the North Asia economy has had on employment and specifically on youth employment? Fergusing. Well, I, I think the, the work of the private sector, private companies, supported by Scottish Enterprise and the Business Gateway and the Scottish Government and the local authorities, has had a, a salutary effect. In fact, I'm able to inform the member that just in the last year, the levels of employment, the employment rate, the number of people in work uh, has increased by 10 per cent to 70 per cent. Now, these are statistics, but an increase of people in jobs of 10 per cent in the members' part of Scotland, I think, shows that we are managing to achieve success. But there's much more work to be done, uh, and uh, I, we will do that working with Mr Gibson, who uh, strongly advocates the economic success for his part of Scotland. Thank you. Question number five, in the name of Joan McAlpine, has not been lodged for understandable reasons. I therefore call question number six, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what social economic benefits would arise from providing interconnectors to our islands. Minister Ferguson. Huge benefits. First, they can meet up to 5% of Great Britain's electricity demand by 2030. Second, the development of the projects themselves and the associated infrastructure uh, would bring jobs and investment to the regions. Uh, for example, Viking Energy has estimated that direct annual income to Shetland associated with the project would be £30.8 million. I have written to uh, the new Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, Amber Rudd, to highlight the strategic importance of this work stream for Scotland and the continued participation of her department in the Scottish Island Renewables Delivery Forum. Thank you, Mike McKenzie. I thank the Minister for that answer, and I wonder if he agrees with me that in addition to these socio-economic benefits, the significant renewable energy generation capacity in Scotland's islands can help keep the UK's lights on, help the UK meet its climate change targets, and that the supply chain will produce significant numbers of well-paid jobs and careers, not only in our islands, but across Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK. Minister. Well, I think that's not an overstatement. And to put it, uh, uh, to put it differently, um, without continued expansion of renewable energy output in Scotland, the UK will have great difficulty in meeting its climate change targets. In fact, some may argue it would be impossible for them so to do. So whilst we need a balanced mix of uh, electricity generation supply, we believe that the harnessing of the island's potential in renewable, uh, uh, renewables is essential. And indeed, the islands are, generally speaking, the best place, for example, wind energy and the, the home of marine energy, wave and tidal power. So all in all, I'm very hopeful that the constructive work that took place with Ed Davey will continue with Amber Rudd, and we are totally committed to working in a constructive fashion to deliver a solution that will release the enormous potential of our islands. Lee McCarthy. Uh, thank you very much, and can I very much uh, thank the Minister for his uh, comments and for taking the step of contacting Amber Rudd, particularly in relation to the continuing work of the island working group but, but could you perhaps update parliament on where discussions are at with the uk government and the european union uh, about an interconnector reflecting the r d nature of the work being carried out by emec in my constituency minister uh, well i i can't and shouldn't speak for the uk government a uh, uh, presiding officer but i mean i can say that prior to the general election there was a reasonable modus operandi of working in fact the the Renewables Island Delivery Group was the only, so far as I'm aware, uh, subject-related working group between the Scottish and the UK governments. And getting around the table with Ed Davey and his officials and ours and others was a very useful and constructive way to do business. I've therefore suggested to Amber Rudd that that modus operandi is continued. We pursue this in a non-partisan way, as I think Mr MacArthur is aware, and we do so because of the enormous price of, for the peoples that uh, Mr MacArthur represents as, as well as those represented by uh, Mr Scott and Dr Allen on the Western and Northern Isles of Scotland. Uh, I do believe that the Prime Minister himself gave an undertaking in a letter to Angus Campbell uh, that uh, the delivery of the island's potential would take place and therefore we look forward 
to uh, seeing the implementation of that prime ministerial pledge. Thank you. Question number seven, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to publish the next oil and gas analytical bulletin. Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. Presiding Officer, we are analysing the fiscal changes that the Chancellor of the Exchequer announced in the budget in collaboration with stakeholders in the industry and assessing the impact that the reforms will have on future investment and production and in turn tax revenues. When this analysis is complete, we will publish an updated oil and gas analytical bulletin. Thank you, Gavin Brown. Presenting officer, the um, analytical bulletin was described as part of a series and was previously published every few months. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me why it hasn't been published for over a year? Cabinet Secretary. For, for the simple reason of the answer I just gave Mr Brown, that there have been significant changes in the tax arrangements around the North Sea, and as a consequence, the Government is considering those in consultation with stakeholders to determine the effect of these changes. And I, don't, I think I would be the first to accept that these were significant changes that the Chancellor made in the Budget in March, and they will take some time to assess as to the effect, given their significance, uh, and what we hope to be beneficial effect on the North Sea regime, which we will discuss with stakeholders. And as I've indicated, we will, when that material is complete, we will publish an updated bulletin. Jackie Bailey. I think many companies in the oil industry have already assessed the impact themselves of the changes made um, in the last budget. But it is a year since we had the last oil and gas bulletin. It is now some two months since the budget. And indeed, Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister, her own commitment to publish. So when are we going to see this revised oil and gas bulletin? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the updated bulletin will be published when the government has completed the analytical work that we're undertaking. And I think the, the point that uh, I made to Mr Brown is that we have to acknowledge the significance of the changes that have been made by the UK government. Uh, Jackie Bailey says that companies have analysed them. Uh, there are many companies that we are talking to who are considering their investment plans as a consequence of the changes to the regime. We need to undertake that work properly to ensure that we can uh, provide Parliament with uh, a clear and substantiated um, uh, analysis, uh, which will be published when this work is complete. Thank you. Question number eight, Ian Gray. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support East Lothian Council's efforts to promote the area as a tourist destination. Minister Ferguson. The, the Scottish Government is supportive of all areas of Scotland working to achieve the industry-led ambition for Scotland to be a, a first-choice tourism destination. East Lothian's stunning assets are extensively marketed and supported by Visit Scotland in a variety of ways, including featuring in the Brilliant Moments marketing campaign and financial support for events such as the Scottish Open. Ian Gray. <clears throat> uh, I thank the Minister for that response. One of the uh, countless compelling reasons for visiting East Lothian is uh, John Muir's birthplace in Dunbar mm -hmm. uh, and the John Muir Way, opened by the former First Minister not so long ago. Uh, last week, I hosted in Parliament a delegation from the Muir Association of Martinez, California, John Muir's home in America. They are very keen to seek opportunities to publicise the John Muir Way in the United States uh, and otherwise working with the, uh, uh, the National Parks Administration there, increase tourism between Muir-related sites in Scotland uh, and America. Can the Scottish Government provide any support for such a project? Minister. Uh, well, I, I think uh, Ian Gray is quite right to promote the attractions of uh, John Muir, his links to Scotland the founder of uh, national parks in the world in Yosemite and the USA and elsewhere. Uh, and the history and achievements of John Muir were celebrated, as Mr Gray mentioned last year, presiding officer, and were supported by the Scottish Government, working in partnership with local council and others. So we are happy to continue how best to continue that work. And I undertake to write to visit Scotland to raise Mr Gray's point and to revert to him after I've done so. Thank you. Question number nine, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what planning and modelling it has carried out regarding the future of the taxation system for local government. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, the Scottish Government, jointly with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, has established the Commission on Local Tax Reform to identify and examine fairer systems of local taxation as alternatives to the Council tax. That work is due to report in the autumn, and I note that the Commission has recently issued and promoted a call for evidence. Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Council tax has now been frozen in Scotland for eight years in a row. 
A Fife Council consultation found that 71 per cent of residents would support a halt on the council tax freeze in order that extra money raised could be spent on vital local services. However, support for that increase falls to 36 per cent if the Scottish Government were to impose a £4.6 million penalty on Fife Council for doing so. Will the Scottish Government consider removing the penalty if Fife Council takes a decision to increase the council tax this year? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think I think I think Jane Baxter rather answered her own question, to be honest, presiding officer, because what Ms. Baxter's question contained was the fact that the Scottish Government essentially compensates local authorities for not increasing the council tax. We provide local authorities with £70 million across the country uh, to enable them to freeze the council tax. That £70 million was set at 3% of the collectible amount uh, back in 2007. Of course, inflation has varied from year to year and, um, it, uh, and, and clearly is very significantly below um, the 3% that um, uh, we are now compensating local authorities for uh, in respect of their agreement not to increase the council tax. Um, so I think that the, the, so the proper financial support has been given to local authorities to support the freeze in the council tax. But I think Jane Baxter also has to remember that members of the public, uh, the individuals paying the council tax, have benefited from having at least one bill that's not gone up in a time of extreme pressure on, public, on, on uh, household finances, particularly for public sector workers yeah, yeah. who have had their pay constrained uh, inevitably by the financial pressures uh, with which we have wrestled. So the council tax freeze is properly funded by government and it also is a contribution to managing the household budgets of hard-pressed families the length and breadth of the country. Thank you. Question 10, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its proposals and discussions for a widening of the powers suggested by the Smith Commission. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, at a meeting on the 15th of May, the Prime Minister undertook to consider Scottish Government proposals for devolution beyond the Smith Commission. We will put those proposals to the UK Government and I will meet the Secretary of State for Scotland to discuss the next steps. Bill Kidd. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Can I ask if there has been a consideration when implementing new tax raising powers of the necessity to vary the Barnet formula on a timescale agreed between the Scottish and Westminster governments rather than, than in the arbitrary manner proposed by some unionist politicians? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Officer, there is a, an explicit um, recommendation of the Smith Commission that a fiscal framework has to be put in place to deal with the financial implications of the changes to the powers um, that are envisaged by the Smith Commission proposals. Uh, that fiscal framework is now the subject of discussion between the United Kingdom Government and the Scottish Government. Um, I have made it clear to the UK Government that uh, a legislative consent motion on the Scotland Bill cannot be considered by this Parliament until such time as we have a clearly acceptable um, a fiscal framework. And for that to be possible, agreement will have to be reached that the uh, fiscal framework is in the interest both of the Scottish and United Kingdom um, interests um, as part of that negotiation. That is what I will be pursuing um, as I take forward the interests of the Parliament and of Scotland in this process. Thank you. Question number 11, Annabel Goldie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has a timescale for the procurement of evidence and engagement in civil, civic consultation in relation to the further powers it is seeking in addition to the Smith Commission proposals. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government um, will set out proposals for devolution beyond the uh, Smith Commission to the UK Government, and I will meet the Secretary of State to discuss the next steps. The Scottish Government is clear that the process that follows and any timetable for action should allow for full engagement with the people of Scotland. Annabel Goldie. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. When I asked him about this issue on the 14th of May in this chamber, um, he replied in relation to seeking evidence and engaging in civic consultation uh, that would be advantageous and beneficial. Is it possible to give the chamber any indication of what sort of timescale or structure he has in mind? Cabinet what I'd say to uh, Ms Goldie is that the, uh, in the course of the, the Smith Commission proposals, there was a uh, the Smith Commission process, um, there was a, an extensive amount of information supplied by members of the public and by a variety of stakeholders across Scotland. And um, 
the Smith Commission did its level best to consider all of those issues, um, but uh, clearly it wasn't possible to do, in the very limited timescale available to us, full justice to all of that material. However, the Scottish Government has been considering that material for some time, um, since last November. Um, we have had um, various discussions with interested parties. And, of course, the election debate itself um, discussed a number of these questions um, uh, as part of that process. So we feel we have a, a, a broad uh, cross-section of opinion that enables us to inform the pr further proposals that we will make to the United Kingdom Government, but I do accept there is a necessity for further consultation um, uh, once those proposals are to hand, and that is exactly what the Scottish Government will pursue in the light of our discussions with the UK Government. Thank you. Question number 12, Ken McIntosh. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy's position is on reclassifying Scottish Futures debt, Trust debt as public borrowing and how much he expects the total to be. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Scottish Futures Trust does not hold itself any public sector borrowing at risk of reclassification. Borrowing associated with the NPD programme is contained within the special purpose vehicle set up for the individual NPD and hub projects. As I have previously advised Parliament, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust are working to resolve current, the current classification issue without the need to call on any contingency arrangements. Ken McIntosh. Uh, can I uh, thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for his reply, although uh, I hope he recognises the worry that all, all members of uh, this Parliament and Scotland will fear about the potential ramifications of reclassifying substantial sums of debt running to the hundreds of millions, if not the billions. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether or not he believes this additional borrowing will come out of the borrowing powers that are coming our way in the Scottish Parliament, whether he is asking the Treasury for additional borrowing, uh, borrowing powers, or whether he believes the Treasury should absorb or write off all of this debt. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the first thing I'd say to, to Mr McIntosh is that in the last part of my answer I said that the Government and the Scottish Futures Trust were working to resolve the current classification issue without the need to call on any contingency arrangements. And that, uh, un without doubt, is my preferred position in this respect, and that is what I am working to secure. Uh, I clearly acknowledge the parliamentary interest on this question. This is, that is why um, I reported in full to Parliament on this question um, when I had sufficient information available to me to enable um, a comprehensive explanation to be given to Parliament of the issues with which we are wrestling. Um, clearly, the matters are still under discussion between the Scottish Government, the Scottish Futures Trust and the Office for National Statistics, and I expect that process will take some time yet to conclude. Um, I have made some contingency arrangements with Her Majesty's Treasury for the handling of any potential implications, and I stress potential implications, because I'm trying to avoid any implications whatsoever uh, in the course of, this, uh, of the last financial year, 2014-15. And, of course, we expect to have a resolution to this issue uh, to enable us to properly take steps to resolve any outstanding questions for the current financial year or later years. Um, but I stress the Government is working with all of its energy uh, to resolve this issue without the need to call on any contingency arrangements. Jack Bailey. The Scottish Futures Trust helpfully provided Spice with a list of the eight capital projects delayed as a result of the reclassification of debt, but I have learnt that there are more projects delayed, like Our Lady and St Patrick's High School. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me exactly how many more capital projects are delayed, and will the Scottish Futures Trust cover the cost of that delay beyond the original eight? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the, we've got to be very careful about our terminology here because the, there are eight projects that are affected by, uh, eight hub projects that are affected by the uh, particular issues. And uh, the, they are six schools and two healthcare projects. And uh, clearly there is a pipeline of projects that will be affected by the, um, the discussions that we're currently having with the Office for National Statistics. Um, we are endeavouring to resolve those discussions as quickly and as timidly as we possibly can do, and all energy is being expended to ensure that is uh, undertaken as quickly as possible. And um, when I'm in a position to provide Parliament with further information on how this matter is being resolved, I will, of course, report to Parliament accordingly. Question number 13, Colin Keir. 
Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what issues it needs to address in the light of the devolution of additional tax raising powers. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, as I have indicated already, negotiation of Scotland's updated fiscal framework is one of my highest priorities in the months ahead. I will continue to make clear to the UK Government that an acceptable fiscal framework is essential to allow the Scottish Government to recommend that Parliament consents to the new Scotland Bill. The interim report of the Devolution of Further Powers Committee highlighted the need for greater clarity on key components of important issues in relation to the need for shared information to support negotiations. I look forward to working constructively with the UK, UK Government to make rapid progress on these issues. Colin Kerr. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Does he have any concerns over the fact there is a lack of statutory involvement in the audit process from the Auditor General of Scotland in dealings with HMRC and the reporting process? Cabinet Secretary. There are, we covered some of this ground at the Public Audit Committee this morning. Um, we were looking at some of the uh, reporting and scrutiny arrangements. And I think it is important that um, where there is to be some form of um, shared uh, institutional basis for acting um, that will have an effect on the spending power of the Scottish Government, that there is the ability to exercise um, uh, appropriate uh, scrutiny arrangements uh, around all of these questions. And um, I think some of these questions are not uh, for me to resolve, they are for the Auditor General and others to resolve uh, to ensure that they are satisfied that the proper and full audit arrangements can be put in place to satisfy the uh, necessary reporting requirements and standards of Parliament. Thank you. Question number 14, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with stakeholders regarding boosting the economy of Edinburgh and the south-east of Scotland. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, officer, ministers meet stakeholders regularly across a range of portfolio interests to discuss boosting the economy of Scotland. Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much. Um, can I specifically ask about the city deal for the south-east of Scotland? Uh, my understanding is that there are key issues in relation to housing, skills and investment in infrastructure that the local authorities are pursuing uh, under the leadership of the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, what support does the Scottish Government offer that process? And does the Minister acknowledge the importance of the project given that the similar Glasgow City deal expects to generate 15,000 construction jobs during their City deal project with the prospect of 28,000 permanent jobs once construction is completed. Um, what are the um, key offers that the Scottish please? Government is making to the partners as they pull the city deal together? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, the six leaders of Edinburgh and south east of Scotland city region wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Innovation on the 1st of April this year, outlining plans to develop an ambitious city deal for the region. The Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities responded positively welcoming this approach on the 22nd of April. Uh, preliminary discussions with Scottish Government and uh, Scottish Futures Trust officials have uh, also uh, taken place. So uh, the Scottish Government adopts, presiding officer, a very positive approach towards uh, these matters, which uh, are not being handled by myself, uh, but which could unleash huge benefits uh, to Edinburgh and the, uh, and the environs. But of course, I think it is reasonable to say, as Sarah Boyack knows, that there has been massive investment in these areas, including in the fourth replacement crossing, the Edinburgh to Glasgow Rail Improvement Programme, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children, NHS Lothian Redevelopment of Royal Edinburgh Hospital Campus, the National Centre for Scottish National Blood Transfusion Services, and three schools. So there has been massive investment in Edinburgh, quite rightly so, uh, and that will continue. So we take a positive approach towards these matters. Thank you. Question number 15, Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to assist the economy in the west of Scotland. Minister Fegg uh, Many actions in economic developments, including supporting businesses, helping young people, investing in infrastructure, and working with others. However, we always want to see what more we can do. Mr. McMillan. I thank the Minister for his answer, and uh, he will be aware of the recent announcements of uh, DB Apparel and Manpower in Inverclyde, who are proposing to transfer. Uh, some jobs overseas, and also RBS and Poundstretcher, who, who are proposing to close uh, some of their operations within Inverclyde. Can I ask the Minister what the Scottish Government can do to try to stop companies moving jobs overseas, and also to secure more Inverclyde investment into Inverclyde, and will they agree to meet with me and the new Inverclyde MP uh, to discuss the matter? Minister. Uh, yes, I'm happy to meet uh, with both. Um, 
we do when we have the opportunity, use every practical lever to persuade companies not to re relocate jobs from Scotland if we have the opportunity so to do. I'm aware of recent announcements which Mr Macmillan uh, has brought to our attention and which we are aware of from the Enterprise Network. And these have obviously caused a great deal of hardship to those people whose jobs are affected, presiding officer. But we are delivering the most competitive business tax regime with 1,001 business premises in Inverclyde paying zero or reduced rates. And just this morning, presiding officer, I was delighted to hear Mark Harvey of Ernst & Young describing that for the third successive year, Scotland has been the most successful part of the UK out with London in securing inward investment. 80 projects, uh, manufacturing projects from 15 to 31, more scientific research projects than at any time in the past decade. Uh, and I can't name them all because time doesn't permit, but I know that uh, one of these projects is concentric, Concentrics in Gurukh with 500 jobs. There are many others. So whilst there are challenges and problems, there are also opportunities, and we are grabbing them with both hands. Thank you. Question number 16, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the economy of Leaving Mouth in Fife. Cabinet Secretary. So the Scottish Government is committed to boosting economic growth and tackling inequality in Scotland. Across Leavenmouth, we continue to support economic growth with investments in infrastructure, in regeneration and in business support. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. And as he knows, the closure of Tullis Russell, uh, the recent closures on Leaven High Street and also the uncertainty surrounding BIFAB is putting significant challenges on the Leavenmouth economy. Um, this afternoon, the Leavenmouth Rail Campaign is holding a conference to put together a business case um, for the infrastructure. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that supporting the Leavenmouth economy isn't just about the reactive measures that's happened recently, but it's also about investment in future growth? And will he work with the Infrastructure Minister to see if we can achieve improved transport links for the area to support the economy in the future. Cabinet Secretary. I agree with the Claire Baker's uh, points, Presiding Officer, uh, and it's for those reasons that we set up the task force um, which brings together jointly with Fife Council to look at the, the wider range of economic issues that are facing the Fife economy because um, Claire Baker has quite rightly talked about the issues uh, around Talis Russell, around uh, Sphere and Turret and Bifab in um, the central Fife um, area, but of course there are other issues around Long Annett in, in West Fife um, and other questions with which we are wrestling. So we certainly will um, look um, positively on proposals that come forward. I've been very pleased with the progress we've made uh, with the task force and the infrastructure secretary who's here, and I have already discussed a, a number of these infrastructure projects that may be of significance in the Fife economy, and we'll be happy to engage on those questions. Thank you. Question number 17, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what is it doing to ensure that no fees, the North of Scotland has a diverse economy? Minister uh, We use all available levers to create the economic conditions to enable the e economy of the North East to thrive. Working closely with a wide range of partners, including the enterprise agencies, Skills Development Scotland and local councils, we work to ensure that businesses of all sizes and sectors can access the support they need to grow. I thank the Minister for his answer. I was partly thinking about the traditional sector like the fishing industry and the food industry. With the Skipper Expo in Aberdeen this week, does the Minister agree with me that attracting the next generation of skippers to the fishing industry is important to their diversity and that every opportunity to support their training and development should be taken? Minister. Hey, yes, of course I do. Uh, fishing is part of Scotland's traditions and cultures and nowhere more so than in the northeast of Scotland. And therefore, we are determined to continue to work with the fishing industry to restore the identity and status of fishing as an occupation of choice for young people in our coastal communities. Thank you. Question 18, Liam MacArthur. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, regarding whether Wave Energy Scotland should be located in Orkney. Minister Fegstring. The Scottish Government has tasked uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise with establishing and operating Wave Energy Scotland. The location of Wave Energy Scotland is therefore a matter for them. Liam MacArthur. Uh, 
Can I thank the Minister for his response? He'll be aware of the investment initiatives and activity taking place in France, Sweden, Australia, uh, Ireland and elsewhere. While WES has the potential to be part of a UK response to drive the industry through the difficulties it experienced, it's clearly not going to be enough. Can the Minister please advise on what other initiatives are under consideration? And will he agree to meet with myself, Councillor James Stock and other local stakeholders when he's in Orkney uh, next week to discuss how the islands I represent can remain at the forefront of what is happening in the wave energy sector. Briefly, please, Minister. Uh, well, well, I'm very happy to, to meet uh, with Liam MacArthur. I'm not quite sure where, but uh, I certainly will be in his constituency at the convention next week. And if there's an opportunity to meet there, then I most certainly will. And I think we have a shared objective in all these matters. Thank you, Minister. That concludes questions. And before we turn to the next item of business, I'll allow a few seconds for members to change places. <laughs>